All right, folks, let's go to the movies. Play it for her, play it for me. You just put your lips together and blow. Go ahead, make my day. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I got a bad feeling about this. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Welcome to the Classic Film Club with Richard Kuypers. Hello and welcome to this meeting of the Classic Film Club, the podcast dedicated to taking a fresh look at movie classics to see how well they stand up today and to discovering hidden gems from the past 120 years of cinema. I'm Richard Kuypers, a critic with the international trade paper Variety, a film festival programmer and documentary producer. And in this show, I'll take a look at three films starring the legendary Marilyn Monroe. One from her early days, another released in 1953, the year that Marilyn became a major star, and also her final film, upon which so much of her legend rests. Whenever lists of Hollywood's greatest female stars are drawn up, Marilyn Monroe is always at the top or very close to it. Catherine Hepburn, Betty Davis, Audrey Hepburn, Greta Garbo, and Ingrid Bergman are among other great names that constantly appear, but Marilyn dominates. Not just for the body of work she left behind, which was only 29 films, including bit parts in a 14-year career, but for the aura her name and image still command. The ultimate Hollywood sex symbol and a tragic figure who struggled with mental health issues and addiction and died in circumstances that have inspired countless books and countless conspiracy theories. It's almost 60 years since Marilyn died, aged just 36, yet her name recognition is still incredibly high and her image still surrounds us. When we think of the terms blonde bombshell and sex symbol, Marilyn Monroe comes to mind more readily than anyone else, still. As a pop culture icon, she's everywhere, from Andy Warhol's famous silkscreen painting that sold for $17 million in 1998, a record at the time for a Warhol original, to Sam Shaw's photo of Marilyn and her flying skirt during the filming of The Seven Year Itch in 1954. Art historian Gail Levin suggests, convincingly, that Marilyn was the most photographed person of the 20th century. Perhaps only Elvis Presley can rival Marilyn as an icon of American popular culture. Her life story has been told in numerous feature films and TV series, and her blonde bombshell look has been adopted by everyone from Madonna to Lady Gaga. For me, one of the most extraordinary uses of Marilyn Monroe imagery is in Tommy, Ken Russell's 1975 adaptation of the rock opera by The Who. The film's eyesight to the blind sequence takes place in what can best be described as a Marilyn Monroe church. Followers wearing Marilyn face masks and wigs are helping blind, deaf and other disabled people touch a massive statue in that famous flying skirt. They're hoping and praying for miracles, while priest Eric Clapton sings and plays guitar, no less. I watched just that sequence from Tommy, then of course I couldn't stop and I watched the whole thing. What an amazing film. Tina Turner as the Acid Queen and Jack Nicholson singing. But I digress, as so often happens when we talk about movies. Let's get back to Marilyn, who was born in Los Angeles in 1926 as Norma Jean Mortensen, and whose troubled mother, Gladys Pearl Baker, worked as a negative cutter at the Consolidated Film Industries Laboratory. She was sent to foster homes and an orphanage, and married at 16. And Marilyn was working at the radio plane munitions factory during World War II when she was discovered by David Conover, a photographer from the first motion picture unit of the US Armed Forces. With a successful career as a model in print advertising and men's magazine, Marilyn landed a six-month contract with 20th Century Fox in August 1946. She didn't appear in anything before her contract expired and was given a second contract which only led to bit parts in Dangerous Years, an undistinguished youth drama, and Scudder Who, Scudder Hay, a forgettable romantic comedy. When this second contract expired, Fox dropped Marilyn, before she was picked up by the much less prestigious Columbia Pictures. They bleached her hair platinum blonde and gave her a starring role in Ladies of the Chorus, which is where I want to stop for a while and look a little bit more closely at the very first film to have Marilyn Monroe's name in large letters on the credits. Running a lean 61 minutes, 
Ladies of the Chorus is a B-grade, black-and-white, backstage musical romance directed by Phil Carlson, who'd made a few Charlie Chan films prior to this, and went on to direct some terrific crime dramas like The Phoenix City Story and Kansas City Confidential. He also had a huge hit in 1973 with Walking Tall, starring Joe Don Baker. In Ladies of the Chorus, Marilyn plays Peggy Martin, a burlesque performer who's out there on the chorus line, alongside her divorced mother May, played by Adele Jurgens, despite the fact that Jurgens was only nine years older than Marilyn. On first release in 1948, Jurgens was given top billing. When Columbia re-released the film in 1952, Marilyn was given top spot, and the opening credits were changed to read Marilyn Monroe in Ladies of the Chorus. As a film, it's okay if nothing special. The standard issue plot finds Peggy stepping out of the chorus line and becoming a star when the temperamental leading lady Bubbles refuses to go on stage. Peggy's biggest fan is Randy, played by Rand Brooks. He's the son of a socially prominent family, and in typical fashion for films of the day, they fall in love on first date and decide to marry. But the big question is whether Randy will have the courage to tell his mother that he wants to take a burlesque queen for his wife and possibly scandalise the family in the process. The film has a couple of peppy tunes, including the opening number, which includes lyrics like, Our flirty, flirty eyes will wink in your direction. We will throw you all a kiss with sweet affection. And Every Baby Needs a Dut Dut Daddy, which is sung by Marilyn and sounds so politically incorrect today as it reinforces the notion that chorus girls are gold diggers hoping to hook a rich boyfriend, like all of the drooling men who come to watch Peggy perform. Toward the end, it squeezes in some social commentary about the unfair stigma attached to women in burlesque, but for the most part, it's a thoroughly average B-musical of its time. What of course makes it worth watching is Marilyn, a full five years before she would land her next leading role. Although it's an unpolished performance, you can see glimpses of what later made her such a star. The slightly breathy delivery, the combination of innocence and sensuality, a sense of hidden sorrow beneath that radiant exterior. But it's just glimpses. Neither the screenplay, Carlson's direction, or Marilyn's confidence are quite strong enough to lift the film out of being pleasant enough, but nothing special. Other points of interest include a very nifty tap dance routine by Adele Jurgens. You can find Ladies of the Chorus online, and it's still well worth a look. It's certainly not a chore to watch, it's a piece of film history, and it's a lot better than the first major films of many other big movie stars. Before she was let go by Columbia, Marilyn did a screen test for Born Yesterday, but she lost out to Judy Holliday, who went on to win an Oscar, playing one of the most memorable dumb blondes of them all. Undaunted, Marilyn continued her acting classes and became involved with Johnny Hyde, who was vice president of the big William Morris Talent Agency. Hyde paid for Marilyn to have plastic surgery on her jaw, and he wanted to marry her, but she knocked him back. Back on the books at Fox again, she scored small but impressive roles in prestigious films such as All About Eve and The Ashfelt Jungle, both made in 1950, supporting roles in comedies like As Young As You Feel and Love Nest, followed by a role in the cracking crime drama Don't Bother to Knock, and another one, Clash by Night, both of those from 1952. 1953 was Marilyn's year. In January, there was the steamy romantic potboiler Niagara, which the American Women's Club movement called immoral, no doubt helping it to become a popular hit. In November came the bubbly, if somewhat overstuffed, rom-com How to Marry a Millionaire, and in the middle was one of Marilyn's career highlights, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, the second film I want to look at in a bit more depth and through 21st century eyes. Talk about starting with a bang. No sooner has the 20th Century Fox logo and the fanfare stopped than Marilyn Monroe and Jane Russell appear in gloriously spangly red dresses and feathered hats singing Two Little Girls from Little Rock, which is just the first of the film's many musical showstoppers. Marilyn is Lorelei Lee, Jane is Dorothy Shaw, their besties and their showgirls. Not burlesque dancers like Marilyn in Ladies of the Chorus, they've got class and they perform in upmarket venues. Lorelei likes men with the means to buy diamonds, while Dorothy prefers bulky beefcakes to bulging bank balances. 
Lorelai is engaged to Gus, Tommy Noonan, a nice but clueless nerd whose rich and domineering father naturally suspects Lorelai of being a gold digger. Esmond Senior is right in a way, but not completely, and that's a crucial factor that makes the film such a crowd-pleasing winner. In plot twists that don't need to be explained here, Lorelai and Dorothy end up on a cruise ship bound for Paris, where Gus will be waiting with a wedding ring, hopefully. Meanwhile, his moneybag's dad has hired private detective Malone, Elliot Reed. His job is to follow Lorelai and get incriminating evidence of her no-good fortune-hunting ways with all the rich men on board the ship. And to that end, Lorelai starts running rings around blustery old British billionaire Sir Francis Piggy Beekman, Charles Coburn at his best. And for Dorothy, there's plenty of distraction with, would you believe it, the US men's Olympic team, who also happen to be on board. It's simply marvellous watching Marilyn Monroe play her dumb blonde character to the hilt. With that almost out-of-breath vocal delivery, she maintains an immaculate and hilarious seriousness as she reels off lines like, I won't let myself fall in love with a man who won't trust me, no matter what I might do. Marilyn and Jane Russell are terrific together. While Marilyn does the slinky, kooky stuff, Jane has a field day as the down-to-earth half of the duo. She's got great wisecracks like, you're the only girl in the world who can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. It's a very funny and racy script for its day, with lots of clever innuendo and double entendres that I'll let you discover or rediscover for yourselves, especially that scene involving Malone and a pair of trousers. How did the censors ever let that through? Then, of course, there's the musical numbers, Jane doing Anyone for Love with the Olympic team, and Marilyn being nothing short of sensational with Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. The magic starts even before the song properly begins, with Lorelai running away from dozens of men who are holding pink hearts up to her. She beats them away with a fan and an ever more high-pitched series of no, no, no's before the song kicks in, and it is pure magic. Gentlemen Prefer Blondes is a bright and breezy outing that's not to be taken seriously, but if we do want to look at it through modern eyes, we could say that it views Lorelei as a classic scheming female who believes that landing a rich husband is her one and only chance to attain the life she wants. Maybe, like Madonna sang in the music video that paid tribute to Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, Lorelei really is a material girl, but in the 1950s, without equal pay, equal career opportunities, and so many other forms of sex discrimination, Lorelei's outlook on life and possible paths to happiness and security have an undeniable truth to them. Context is everything, and it's through this understanding of the times in which the film was made that we can understand and appreciate what Lorelei and Dorothy were facing in the conservative 1950s. Even when she seems to be very much a material girl, there's also a strong feeling that there's more to Lorelei than meets the eye. It's worth remembering that the source material of Gentlemen Prefer Blondes is the 1925 best-selling novel, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, The Intimate Diary of a Professional Lady, written by Anita Luz, the pioneering playwright and author who became the first female staff scriptwriter in Hollywood when she was hired by D.W. Griffith in 1912. Her novel was first filmed in 1928 with Ruth Taylor and Alice White. Sadly, this is now a lost film and it was later turned into a stage musical in 1949. The spirit of Luz's novel, with its wise and witty observations of male and female attraction, remain intact in this film, and they make the difference when Dorothy and especially Lorelei make big decisions about the men in their lives. As Lorelei says, I can be smart when it's important, but most men don't like it. It also helps to explain why, beneath all the gloss and fluff, the film rang emotionally true with audiences while entertaining them so wonderfully that it became the world's seventh highest grossing film in 1953. Complete with stunning costumes that Jane and Marilyn wear, and wear very well indeed, great musical direction from the ever-reliable Lionel Newman, and Marnie Nixon providing the high vocal notes Marilyn couldn't quite reach, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes is a bright and breezy treat that stood the test of time and it's sure to delight audiences forever. Highly recommended viewing. When nude photos of Marilyn that were taken in 1949 appeared in the first issue of Playboy in December 1953, it could easily have destroyed her career. But the opposite happened. 
Marilyn became an even bigger star. Such was her popularity with both male and female audiences, and such was the sheer, almost otherworldly sensuality and sexuality she projected. Her studio, 20th Century Fox, wanted Marilyn to keep playing dumb and ditzy blondes, but Marilyn had other, higher ambitions. Declaring that she was tired of the same old sex roles, Marilyn had a long legal battle with Fox about pay rates and choice of films, and even set up her own company, Marilyn Monroe Productions. During this time, she was studying acting with British coach Constance Collier and attended classes at Lee Strasberg's famous Actors Studio. Many in the press mocked her serious ambitions, and the 1955 film Will's success spoil Rock Hunter was a thinly veiled satire on Marilyn's desire to be taken seriously. Meanwhile, platinum blonde Marilyn types began popping up on screens. 20th Century Fox hit the jackpot with Jane Mansfield in Rock Hunter and The Girl Can't Help It. Universal had less success with bombshell Mamie Van Doren in Running Wild and Star in the Dust, before she shone briefly at Warner Brothers in Untamed Youth and at MGM in High School Confidential and Beat Generation. But it was Marilyn who eventually succeeded and endured by refusing to accept her fate as just a sex symbol, branching out into serious acting and winning acclaim for roles such as Cherie, a singer dreaming of stardom in Joshua Logan's bus stop, and Elsie, the music hall star who captures the heart of royalty in the 1957 romantic comedy The Prince and the Showgirl, directed by and co-starring the legendary Laurence Olivier, who famously clashed with Marilyn, calling her a bitch and apparently just wanting her to do nothing more than an imitation of Vivian Lee, his wife, who'd played the lead role on the London stage. That didn't mean Marilyn turned her back on being sexy, sensuous and ditzy. She simply set the gold standard for these female types in films like The Prince and the Showgirl, Let's Make Love, and the all-time great comedy hit Some Like It Hot. Then, of course, there was her final film, The Misfits, in 1961, also the swan song of Hollywood legend Clark Gable, and the unfinished feature Something's Got to Give, which was shut down after Fox fired Marilyn and was eventually reworked as Move Over Darling in 1963, with Doris Day and James Garner in the lead roles. Our third stop on this Marilyn Monroe meeting of the Classic Film Club is The Misfits, which I hadn't seen since I was a teenager, a long, long time ago. I'm so glad I looked at it again recently. It made me realise how I hadn't really appreciated it properly before. I was immediately struck by the opening title sequence, animated jigsaw puzzle pieces that drift across the screen, a portent of the story it tells about characters searching for their place in the world, and a reflection of how troubled Marilyn's life had become by July 1960 when it began shooting. Though Some Like It Hot had been a major hit and earned Marilyn a Golden Globe, her next film, Let's Make Love, was only a modest success and it had mixed reviews. Gossip Queen Hedda Hopper said it was the most vulgar film Marilyn had ever done. Her marriage to the great American playwright and author Arthur Miller was also on the rocks, and it was Miller, with almost no screenwriting experience, who'd written The Misfits. He wrote it as a love letter and a vehicle for Marilyn to show her dramatic range. And it did just that. Marilyn's outstanding as Rosalind Tabor, a newly divorced 30-year-old living in Reno. She goes out for a celebratory drink with her landlady and best friend Isabel, the wonderful Thelma Ritter, and tells her, I always end up back where I started. There's so much pain in Rosalind's observation, and it sets up the film's central theme of people going around in circles, unable to break free from the past and find a place they can emotionally call home. The black and white photography by Russell Metty, who just won the Oscar for Spartacus, is stark and gritty, almost like a newsreel as it brings Rosalind into the company of three damaged men. The first is Gay Langland, Clark Gable, an ageing ex-cowboy, living off memories of his younger days as he drifts from town to town and woman to woman. Within hours of meeting Rosalind, Gay wants to marry her. So too does Gay's buddy, Guido, Eli Wallach, a tow truck driver and pilot who flew in the war and is clearly suffering PTSD, a condition that wouldn't be categorised as such until 1980. Back then, everything was simply called shell shock. The third man is Perce Howland, Montgomery Clift in his third last film. He's a penniless rodeo rider who's been cheated out of inheriting the family ranch and spends a large part of the film in a concussed daze after suffering yet another fall in the ring. 
Much of the film takes place in the dusty Nevada desert. Gay and Guido, and less enthusiastically Howland, plan to make money by rounding up wild mustangs. But when Rosalind discovers exactly what fate awaits the animals, it triggers a dramatic series of events that forces each man to finally look in the mirror and see himself in a harsher new light. In the midst of all this damaged machismo is Rosalind, an innocent and fragile beauty who at various times plays the roles of mother, sister, daughter, nurse, and even nun to these badly broken men. The Misfits was made under such difficult circumstances, it's a wonder it was even completed, let alone as powerful as it is. The temperature was often around 40 degrees, Marilyn habitually turned up late and had trouble with her lines, and at one stage production was halted while she went to detox to tackle her addiction to prescription drugs. Director John Huston, an American great who made the Maltese Falcon, the African Queen, and the forgotten classic Wise Blood in 1979, was frequently drunk and even fell asleep on set. And yet for all of these problems, The Misfits stands up very well. Despite some clunky dialogue and choppy storytelling, the tale of a woman caught up in this harsh, rough male environment resonates very strongly. Arthur Miller's screenplay questions the very essence of American virility, the romantic figure of the cowboy, and pictures him as lost, outdated, and out of touch. His only hope of survival and renewal is through the love and caring of a woman such as Rosalind, who sometimes screams and sometimes soothes to help him find a way forward. The Misfits barely broke even at the box office, and like so many films that weren't hits on first release, its stature has risen steadily over the years. Part of that is related to the legacy of the film. When we watch The Misfits, we can't help but be reminded that this was Marilyn's last completed film, and also the final screen appearance of Clark Gable, the undisputed King of Hollywood in the 1930s, star of It Happened One Night, Gone with the Wind, and six films with Gene Harlow, another blonde movie goddess whose life ended far too soon. Gable died aged 59, only 10 days after filming finished. His fatal heart attack probably brought on by performing more of his own stunts than he should have. And then there's tortured and troubled Montgomery Clift, who would only appear in two more films before he passed away in 1966 at the age of 45. The last time Clift was seen alive was on the same night The Misfits was on TV. All of this adds to the experience of watching The Misfits almost 60 years after first release. I don't think it's quite the American classic some have called it, but it's a very fine film and well worth watching. That concludes our Marilyn Monroe meeting today. I hope this inspires you to look at one or more films featuring this most extraordinary icon of cinema. It's often been said that Marilyn made love to the camera, and no truer words have ever been spoken. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. This is the Classic Film Club with Richard Kuypers. Time now for our classic film club discovery section, where we turn the spotlight on lesser-known films that deserve to be more widely seen. This week's title came to me while I was watching Ladies of the Chorus, maybe because it's also in black and white, it's low budget, and includes a couple of musical interludes. But there, the similarities very definitely end. Made in 1945, filmed in just six days on a budget of next to nothing, is Detour, an all-time film noir classic, and one of the greatest examples of American Poverty Row cinema. Poverty Row was the name given to super low-budget companies with offices on or near Gower Street in Los Angeles. Outfits such as Monogram Pictures, Republic Pictures, Producers Releasing Corporation, Grand National Films, and CBC Productions, which evolved into Columbia Pictures, producer of Ladies of the Chorus, and still one of Hollywood's major studios. Detour is a gritty, grimy, fatalistic film noir. It's about Al Roberts, a hitchhiker whose journey from New York to LA becomes a nightmare brought about by the worst run of believable bad luck you'll ever see. When we first meet Al, he's in a roadside diner, despondently drinking coffee and arguing with another customer who's put a song on the jukebox. The song reminds Al of happier times, when he played piano in a New York club and had a steady girlfriend, Jane, the club's singer. But Jane left the Big Apple to try her luck in LA, and Al's in this diner right now because he became restless and unhappy after Jane left and decided to hitchhike across the country. 
The plan was to show up on Jane's door unannounced, then live happily ever after. To say things didn't quite work out that way is an understatement, to say the least. It's how things go wrong for Al that makes Detour so compelling. His voiceover narration is packed with great lines such as, That's life. Whichever way you turn, fate sticks out a foot to trip you up. He describes money as a piece of paper crawling with germs. The people he meets along the way are as damaged and desperate as he is. First, there's Haskell, a rich man who gives Al a ride. He seems nice enough, but what are those scratch marks on his hands all about? Then there's Vera, a young woman tangled up in the kind of trouble that could make Al's dreams come true, or just as easily ruin his life. You have never seen a femme fatale quite like Vera. She's in a class of her own, and I don't say that lightly. In Al's words, man, she looked like she'd been thrown off the crummiest freight train in the world. Yet in spite of that, I got the impression of beauty. Played with mesmerizing intensity by the aptly named Anne Savage, Vera barks, snaps, and torments Al with pungent dialogue like, If you act wise, mister, you'll pop into jail so fast it'll give you the bends. The tragic irony is that many years later, actor Tom Neal, who plays Al, did in fact end up in jail for the involuntary manslaughter of his wife. The hurried production and minuscule budget work in the film's favour. There's a sense of urgency, a propulsion to the story that's remarkable. You can almost see cast and crew working frantically to finish in about a quarter of the time it usually would have taken to film a story such as this in 1945. With barely a dime for set design, the nightclub where Al and Jane work is little more than a couple of chairs and great lighting design by cameraman Benjamin Klein. The filming of Jane's signature song, I Can't Believe You're Falling In Love With Me, is a real highlight, and don't be surprised if you have that song in your mind for a long time to come after seeing the film. Based on the 1939 novel Detour, an extraordinary tale by Martin M. Goldsmith, this existential film noir was directed by Edgar G. Ulmer, a migrant from what's now the Czech Republic, who made many, many great low-budget films. We'll be here forever if I start to go on about Ulmer. He's that great. So I'll encourage you to check out Detour just for now. You can see the glorious, restored and uncut print on Prime Video. And then you might even want to seek out some of his more easily accessible films, like The Black Cat from 1934, the only film Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff ever appeared in together, The Freudian Crime Noir, Strange Illusion from 1945, the puppet-related horror Bluebeard from 1944, and The Naked Dawn, a rare Technicolor crime drama for Alma made in 1955. Although there, I did end up going on a bit about Edgar G. Alma, but he's so great, he's worth the time, and I do encourage you to try and find some of his films. And finally, a quick trip to the classic film club Trash and Treasure Bazaar. We featured quite a few monochrome movies this week, and I'm keeping things black and white with a recommendation to check out a miraculous American independent feature made in 1962. Carnival of Souls was the only feature film by Herc Harvey, a maker of industrial and training films based in Lawrence, Kansas. One day while out driving, Harvey spotted Saltair Pavilion, an abandoned resort on the shores of Lake Utah, and decided he wanted to use it as the central location for a horror film. His colleague and friend, John Clifford, came up with a story that begins with Mary Henry, a young woman from a small town, going for a joyride with her friends. When two boys in another car challenge them to a race, Mary's vehicle winds up careening off a bridge and sinking into the river below. That's all I'm going to say. The rest is for you to discover. But I will say that this is no ordinary horror film. It's a dreamy, surreal, and sublime journey to strange and captivating places. Carnival of Souls drifted into obscurity almost as soon as it was released. Then, in 1989, it was rediscovered, re-evaluated, restored, and re-released in cinemas to great success. I have wonderful memories of watching a brand new print of Carnival of Souls at the Mandolin Cinema in Sydney with an audience that frequently gasped at its beauty and its mystery. There is a generation of film buffs that know about Carnival of Souls, but 1989 is a long time ago now, and I'm really pleased to keep the name of this film alive here and encourage you to seek it out. It's currently available on Prime Video. 
And on that note, it's time to say the Classic Film Club Carnival is over for this week. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to our next meeting. Bye for now. You can't go now. Work here is done. I love a happy ending. You've been listening to the Classic Film Club with Richard Kuypers. Available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.